thank you very much. It's so good to be with you guys um, up here in Pennsylvania. Actually, I'm based in our Georgia office, as you can probably tell from my heavy southern accent. But uh, I'll try and speak intelligently for <laughs> represent the South. Uh, but it is good to be here. Actually, did quite a bit of work up in Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of legal issues to pop up, and so it's great to be here. Um, as Gary was saying, I do have three or two kids or three kids now. Third one's on the way in January. Um, and I, I want to tell a little story that's going to be the theme of all this. So when we found out we were expecting with our first child, uh, Benjamin, who's now three, I wanted to get my wife something really special, uh, something I knew she would use. And so I was like, a baby bag. That's what we need. It's just a really great baby bag. You know, I always knew it's important for women. And my wife likes the coach purses. They make really nice purses. And so there's a little coach outlet by us. And so I went and was looking and found this absolutely gorgeous baby bag. And this thing was like, I mean, it had all this attachments and equipment. And it was specially designed so it was like waterproof. So if you spill milk in the bag, it just wipes right out. Absolutely awesome. So I gave it to her, we were very excited, and uh, one of the best features, it had this little changing pad you could get out, and so no matter where you were, you could throw it on the floor, do the changing, all that. So shortly after Benjamin was born, we were traveling, and he had an accident in his diaper. We go to an Arby's to try and change it. We walk in there, there's no changing table, nothing to do it. It's like, okay, so we go back out to the car, and I'm like, hey, fortunately, we've got that changing pad, right? And so. We, we get in the front seat of the car, and it's about to rain, so we're trying to rush to do this, and we lay the, the changing pad out on the front seat of the car, and we're rushing, we're trying to get it done, and right in the middle, you women especially know what's going to happen, right in the middle of us changing, and right when the diaper's off, what happens? He decides to give us a little extra. So, it's everywhere, and it's raining, and I'm like, well, hey, it's okay, right, because we've got that changing pad. No, 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 no. That changing pad was Teflon coated, so everything was kitted and bounced right off. So by the end of it, the only dry thing in that entire car and on me was that stupid changing pad. <laughs> so what did I say all this for? I want you guys to be like that. I want your release time programs to be Teflon coated. I want you to be so well informed of the law, so up to date on what the law is, that when someone comes against you guys to try and say, hey, you can't do that at our school, you can't do this release time thing, you can't hand out those flyers, you're so Teflon coded, you're so in compliance with the law that the accusations bounce off of you. And I take this from this great scripture. It's from Matthew chapter 26. You guys know it well. Um, Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin. They were accusing him of all of these things. And it said, Now the chief priests, the elders, and the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found what? None. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. They were Teflon coated. They were Jesus was Teflon coated. He was so in tune with the law, which he fulfilled perfectly and with God's will, all they could come up with lies against him, and even those fell short. And all that at the end they could say is, well, we don't like you, and we're going to put you to death for that. That's how I want it to be with you guys. I want it to be that all at the end of the day they can't say, oh, you're violating this law, you're violating that law. All they can say is, well, we just don't like you guys. And hey, if they're saying that against us, we know we're doing something right, correct? All right. So I think you guys have hands out. What I want you to do is we're going to be kind of going through this. Um, I'm going to leave plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. I know you guys have a lot of situations that pop up, and I want to be able to address those. Those we can't get to today, and I'll be around during lunchtime, and would love to meet with you guys, learn more about what you do. You have the law on your side. A lot of people think, well, these release time things, you know, they're kind of stretching the law. Maybe we're kind of pushing into an area that's not really well established. Absolutely wrong. This is actually one of the most well-established areas of law out there, is the constitutionality of release time. So about 60 years ago, there was this case, Zorak v. Clausen. You don't need to remember it. But this is what the Supreme Court said about release time, the case that upheld release time. And the court said this. I love this quote. We are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. We guarantee the freedom to worship as one chooses. We make room for a wide variety of beliefs and creed as the spiritual needs of man be necessary. We sponsor an attitude on the part of the government that shows no partiality toward any group and that lets each flourish according to the zeal of adherence and the appeal of its dogma. 
Here's my favorite. When the state encourages religious instruction, when the state encourages what you guys do and cooperates with religious authorities, cooperates with your release time programs, with groups like Joy L, it follows the best of our traditions. That's the Supreme Court. That's the law. So if someone says it's, it's release time and taking kids out of school to go give them Bible training, is that even legal? The Supreme Court said it was 60 years ago. Nothing has changed. What you are doing is the best of Americans' traditions. It's the best of what our founding fathers envisioned when they established this nation so many years ago. You are not an abnormality. You're what our founding fathers wanted, a nation where religious freedom flourishes, where religious instruction is a part of the daily education of students. So I want you guys to go forth in boldness that the Supreme Court is on your side, our founding fathers are on your side, and as we're serious, we're going to dive in here. The laws are completely on your side. You are Teflon coded if you follow all of this stuff. So let's dive into it. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to hit a couple of real points. The, these first ones you guys don't really have to worry about too much. Um, they're more for other release time ministries. Uh, a lot of them are just local ones. They're, they're affiliated with the church. They don't have the benefits that you guys do of being under Joy Hill Ministries. Um, but just real quick, so a lot of, like I said, many release time programs, they're just a local church that feels led to do it. But a lot of them we're seeing more and more are much more organized. We love these. Uh, there's a standalone nonprofit like Joy Hill Ministries, and you guys operate under that umbrella, obviously within your own local churches as well. But um, the benefits are great of that. You guys get a lot of the organization, you get a lot of the materials, you get all of that stuff, and you get a lot of extra legal protection as well. One of the great things in talking with Gary about uh, kind of the things offered is the insurance. This is one thing we're a big fan of. What we want to do is we want you guys to be the ones that set the standards for safety for kids. We want people to say, man, you know, schools, all of the stuff that's happening. But you know what? When my kids are with release time, I trust that they're safe. I trust that they're taken care of, that the following, the good precautions are being taken care of. And so when you guys have these types of general liability insurance, just kind of covering general, uh, you know, if there was a slip and fall, all that you guys think, you know, the kids' medical expenses are covered. Same thing with uh, director DNO insurance. It's really more protection for sort of your leadership for the decisions you make and things like that. Uh, and finally, vehicle insurance for your buses, for your church vans, whatever you use to pick it up. But again, if you got more questions about this, talk to Gary, talk to the Joy L. They can get into this with you, kind of explain what Joy L offers and, and some things like that. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So the big issue you guys are probably seeing is attacks against our religious liberties going on across the nation. Um, we're seeing targets, especially when it comes to matters of conscience. One thing you guys may have heard of is the Hobby Lobby Conestoga Wood case, right? Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Supreme Court just ruled on this a couple months ago. Um, everyone knows Hobby Lobby, and they're a fantastic corporation. Um, but there was a second group, Conestoga Wood, uh, which is a here based here in Pennsylvania, I think in East Earl, a family Mennonite-owned woodworking shop. Um, Alliance Defending Freedom, the group I've with, had the pleasure to represent them. But the case dealt with this. So you've got Obamacare and all of these new regulations, and one of them said every company has to pay for abortifacients. Now they'll say contraceptives, right? But to our clients, they knew these are things that once a pregnancy starts, it can terminate a life, kill an infant in the womb. And they said, we refuse to pay for those things. We are not going to have any part in snuffing out a, saint, a sacred life that God has created. So they start filing all of these objections and everything, and the government says, I don't care, you have to pay for them. You're just a business. You give up your rights when you go into business. You don't get to have your religious faith. You have to check it at the door when you punch in at the office every day. So we filed this case, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court struck down those portions of the law and said, no, you don't give up your religious liberties. They're not limited to the four corners of a church, but when you're out in public, when you're at your workplace, wherever you are, the law protects your right to act according to your conscience and to your religious faith. It's a really important case, and we're seeing a lot of repercussions and, and positive benefits from out of that. But this is why it's so important for you guys and all that you do to make sure that your churches, your organizations, your release time programs are Teflon coded. One of the great things about Conestoga Wood was if you look at their bylaws and all of their governing documents, they incorporated their faith to it. They said, we're an unashamedly Christian organization. We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe in the sanctity of God's marriage. 
of marriage. And so when all this goes to court, they can say, look, everything about our corporations is we're religious. That this is what our beliefs, that we follow the dictates and commands of the Bible. And the court said, that's absolutely right. You do. And government, you can't step on their toes. And you can't tell them they can't follow that. So I encourage you guys, uh, obviously your bylaws for Joy L are in great shape, but even take a chance for, take an opportunity to look at your church's bylaws. Maybe it's time to add some stuff about marriage. One of the big things we're seeing is with same-sex marriage, groups start to say, hey, we want to use your church facilities for our marriage. And the day will come they will say, and we want you, pastor, preacher, priest, to perform our marriage for us. And if you don't, we're going to sue you because now you're discriminating against us. We think that's wrong. We're ready to defend those cases. But the best thing your organization can do is to incorporate those religious beliefs into your bylaws, into your church founding documents. Uh, and so if you want more guidance, we've got a great website, speakupmovement.org slash church. You can get examples of bylaws and things like that. They can help give you guidance on that. All right, let's go to the next slide. Let's get into the release time stuff. All right. So there's a couple of issues that we always see. Why do release time programs fail? The number one is internal governance issues. Um, again, this probably applies a lot more to uh, release time organizations that aren't affiliated with groups like Joy L and, and kind of umbrella organizations. But one of the big issues is lack of uh, transition. That you get a group of people that kind of started it and they do it and they grow into the program thrives and then maybe they retire or they pass away and there's no one to pick up the torch and keep running with it. So that's one of the big issues. But the second big issue is failure to operate legally. Something happens, uh, a challenge is brought against your program or a challenge is more likely brought against the school for allowing your program. And because something's not done right, because you didn't take those steps to be Teflon coded, a group like the ACLU or Freedom from Religion or one of these atheist groups is able to come in and chop the legs out from underneath your program. So what we're going to focus on today is the legal part of this, the second one. So let's go to the next slide. Three big legal issues I want to hit today. Number one, location. Where you have your release time program matters. Number two is financial support from the school. The general rule of thumb is you can't receive funding or support directly from the school. Third one is parental permission slash registration of kids. We want you guys to make sure that parents are aware of what's going on, that the school's aware of what's going on, and that kids are where they're supposed to be, and you don't have someone coming into your program without having gotten the proper permission to do so. All right, so let's go to the next slide and discuss the first one. Location, location, location. So the big rule and the thing that has been the most uh, troublesome issue, at least in terms of court cases, is when schools have invited release time programs to actually operate inside the school building. One of the first cases actually dealt with the release time instructors would come in into the classroom, the teacher would leave, go to the teacher's lounge or whatever, and the release time instructors would take over, and if a kid didn't want to participate in them, or their parents didn't want them to, then the kid was basically booted out of the classroom and sent to go sit in the library. And the court looks at that and says, look, we believe religious instruction is important, but we also realize that the school has to be neutral when it comes to religion. It can't favor certain religions over others. Uh, it can't favor non-religion over religion. The school itself has to be neutral. And so it's really, a lot of times we say, man, I wish the school would be more beneficial to us and whatnot and, and be some more supportive of us. But the good part of neutrality from the school's perspective is, as long as the school is neutral, you guys get to thrive. When the school steps back and says, hey, we're not going to treat anybody special, any student that wants to participate in this can, we're going to allow them to be released to release time programs. When the school stays neutral, you guys are unleashed to do whatever you want to within the confines of the law. And so it really empowers you guys. But one other thing, it also makes sure that non-Christian, let me just say this with you guys, it makes sure that maybe groups hostile to religion or hostile to Christianity aren't able to dominate the school and exclude you guys. We see this in other parts of the country where Muslims are doing release times, um, other groups like that are doing release times. And the thing is, when the door is open to them, the door is open to you. And we may look at that and say, well, that's kind of a threat to us. They're not a threat. I know who wins. I've read the Bible. I know how the outcome is. You put God up against any false religion, and I know who wins. 
And that's the confidence I have in the gospel, is that when the door is open to everybody, it's open to us. And when we get our foot in the door, God can be unleashed in the lives of these kids to impact the world for Christ. So, neutrality, although it may sound bad, it's actually a great thing for you guys. So, when it comes to location, our guidance is have it off campus. A church nearby, uh, maybe a, a rental facility. And this is one that a lot of people don't think about is there may be, let's say, a, a library next door to the school, a publicly owned library or maybe a civic center. If they allow that civic center to be rented out, you guys have a right to rent it out and take the kids there and do your release time instruction there. So you may say, well, there's not really a church nearby or there's not a location. Start thinking creatively. Think outside the box. Just because you can't park a trailer on a school property or something like that doesn't mean, again, you can't bring your bus and park it on the corner. Doesn't mean you can't rent out a local facility nearby. So the only rule is not on school property. There are a few exceptions to that that I'll get into a little bit later. Not on school property, so find some other location to hold you guys' ministry. Uh, and then, again, you have nothing to fear of someone saying, oh, you're getting special benefit. You're being allowed to come into the classroom. All right, second issue I want to get into, financial support from the school. This is another one where there's been some cases that have popped up out there. So it usually something that happens like this. The school comes along and says, hey, we really love your release time program. Uh, we want to be able to financially assist you guys. How about you let us take care of all of your printing needs? How about we give you one of our buses to use? And we look at it and say, man, that's fantastic. The school's really supporting us. The problem is, and again, this is from the school's perspective, this is where the school's going to get sued, not you guys, but now the school is starting to show favoritism, right? And the law is, school has to be neutral. So what's our advice on all of this? The school can't directly fund or give any special benefit to you guys financially. So it can't, again, allow you guys to use a bus free of charge or something that it's not giving to every other group out there. Now, what does this mean? Well, what if, uh, you know, the school has like a uh, extracurricular activities program and they want to include us in there. We want to be included in there. Do we have to pay for that? Not at all. The courts have said when you've got sort of, a, they call it an incidental expense, the school's already spending that money to print that brochure, right? And so including you guys in there is one of the opportunities offered for students does not create an extra financial burden on the school. So anything like that, you guys are allowed to do. You're allowed to have your name included in these opportunities. Uh, if they've got a school website that they run and they list, you know, hey, here's a bunch of activities that our students can do. And they've got groups like Boy Scouts and uh, after school clubs. You guys have a right to be included in there and you don't have to worry about having to pay for the two pennies or whatever it costs to include your name on the website. However, one good rule of thumb is a lot of times we've seen schools say, hey, we'd love to print the uh, permission slips, the forms for you to distribute them at the school. The best practice is for you guys to say, hey, I really appreciate that. I appreciate you wanting us to help us out, but we really want to follow the law. We want to, really want to do the right thing and not jeopardize you guys. So you can print them, but let us know what the cost is. Let us pay you back for them. And so that way you guys are making sure that the school is also Teflon coded. You're making sure the school is secure and that they don't get sued for not complying with the law or showing special favoritism to you guys or something like that. All right, last big point I want to hit, and we'll go to the next slide, is parental permission slash registration. All right, so one of the stories I heard was there was this release time program operating, and uh, they started kind of doing the count of students, and there was an extra student. And they said, oh, something's wrong here. What had happened was the student had so wanted to come to release time, but didn't have a parental permission slip. He slips out of class, goes out a side door, comes around, sneaks onto the bus, gets on the bus, goes to release time, and there was concerns. All right, nothing bad happened, everything was fine, they got it worked out. You gotta make sure you've got the kids that you're supposed to and not kids that don't wanna come. And I know you may be thinking, Matt, how can I tell a kid they can't come and receive the gospel? I mean, that's what we're supposed to do. If these kids are that hungry, shouldn't I welcome them? Yes and no. I'm a firm believer in parental authority. Um, I believe it's biblical. I look at it, and what does the Bible say? Parents have the obligation and duty to direct their upbringing of their children, first and foremost. I, that's why we are such big advocates to get a parental permission slip. 
The law tells you guys you need to do it because students are supposed to be at school and the only way they should be released is if the parents are saying, we want our students to receive this instruction. And so it provides protection for the school, so the school can always account for where students are. It provides protection for you guys because you can always say, we have the students that are supposed to be here, whose parents have approved them to be here. But I think most importantly, it shows proper respect for parental authority. So what happens if you've got some kid, they want to come, man, they're desperate to come, and they just can't get their parent to sign a permission slip. See, I look at that and I say, God has opened the door. Find out who those kids' parents are. Call them up. Go drop them a visit. Hey, I heard your son Johnny wanted to come to our program. I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do. Perhaps this is something you'd be comfortable with Johnny coming and participating in. Hey, and by the way, let me tell you about our church. We've got a fantastic church. We'd love to have you to come and visit our church. Now, that student's desire, which is the easy thing would be, well, let's let them come to release time. Because you follow the law, because you were Teflon coded, you've now had an opportunity to witness not only to the child, but to his parents. So look at these opportunities where you might say, man, how can I tell that kid no? It's not a no. It's God giving you the opportunity. There's someone hungry for the gospel. And you get an opportunity to go to them and share the message with them. And hopefully they'll sign that permission slip and you'll have Johnny in the program. And you'll be Teflon coded in the school and you have nothing to worry about. Uh, another thing uh, that pops up is what if you've got a disruptive child? It happens sometimes. You try and work with them. Uh, maybe you've got you know, a timeout procedure or something like that. But you get this child that just again and again and again, you can't control. And you need to excuse from the program and just tell them they can't come. One thing we really recommend is put those notices on your forms or send it home and just let parents know, hey, if your child continues to be disruptive to our program so that we can't do it, we're going to have to dismiss them from the program. You have the authority to do that. Don't feel like you have to keep taking a child that uh, is intentionally and unrepentantly disruptive of your programs. Now again, you can use your discretion about where that line is. You may want to say, hey, this is a problem child and, and God's calling us to minister to that kid especially. And if that's the case, then go for it. But don't feel like you can't exercise control over who's there and who's not. And if the time comes, the student just can no longer be in there. You are well within your rights to say, I'm sorry, you're not allowed anymore, and they have to stay at school. Another big issue come up is with photo video releases. Everybody loves to take photos of the kids. I, we were watching some of them this morning of some of the kids reading the Bible verses, uh, Psalms 23 that they learned, seeing how God is impacting them through your programs. This is fantastic, and I encourage you guys to do it. But get parental permission first. Now, is this something that's like a hard and fast rule? Well, generally, no. Uh, most the, the kind of general state of law is if somebody's in a public place, you've got the right to take their picture. The, the reason we say this is, number one, they're not really in a public place when they're in you guys' program. Number two, though, and again, most importantly, it respects parental rights and parental authority. There may be a situation where, unbeknownst to you, uh, perhaps this child comes from a broken home and there's, there's a, a father that has a restraining order against him. And we've heard cases of someone going on social media, going on a Facebook site, hey, now they, that father or someone that's not supposed to have access to that child knows where they are, where they're going to be at your release time program, and they're waiting out front to say, hey, no, it's okay, I'm his dad, I, I gave him, I, I have permission to pick him up. Or something where now that person is violating the law, violating a restraining order. So you want to protect your kids. That's really what this is about, is protecting your kids. We don't know what the circumstances are, and so just getting that permission slip, sending it home with the parents and saying, is it okay if we publish a post, a picture of your kid, a video of your kid on our website? Is it okay if we use that? Probably 99% of the parents are going to say, oh, that's fine, that's great. We love seeing pictures of what Johnny and Susie are doing in your program. But there may be those kids that need that special protection, and you guys want to be the standard for protection of your kids. You want to be the one the schools are saying, hey, I, I saw you guys have that video release on that permission slip form. Uh, do you think we need something like that? I want you guys to be the standard bearers that schools are looking to and how to take care and direct kids rather than vice versa. So make sure you get permission slips before you post any videos. Uh, one other thing, just like I was talking about, watch your access points. If students are getting on the bus, check off their names from whatever permission slips you have or an attendance sheet. Make sure that the kids that are supposed to be there are there and the kids that aren't supposed to be there 
go through the process of getting your permission slip before they come. All right, so I want to hit a couple of other issues that uh, we see pop up a lot. So this next slide deals with this concept of equal access. And, and what this stands for is whatever any other community group is allowed to do, you guys are allowed to do. If another community group is sending home flyers with kids, they're going home in their backpacks on Fridays advertising a soccer league or a scouting program or whatever, you guys have a constitutional right to have the exact same access. So we see this a lot with schools. Maybe they've got a community bulletin board. Maybe they have, uh, again, take home flyers weekly or monthly or something like that. Maybe they have a page on their website where community groups can post flyers. Whatever other groups are allowed to do, you're allowed to do to promote your group. Another great opportunity we've seen is a lot of schools have open house nights. Uh, perhaps it's an evening when parents come and get to meet the teachers, but they also open it up to allow community groups to set up a table in the lobby. Uh, parents can walk by, get more information. Take advantage of those opportunities. So get in touch with your school officials, with the principal. Find out what type of opportunities there are. But in addition, talk to other groups. Get to know some of the other student organizations in your area and find out what they do to promote their activities, to promote their programs. Because when the door is open for them, like we were talking about earlier, the door is open for you. And they can't say, well, yeah, I know we allow you know, these sports leagues and whatever, but they're not religious. You guys are religious, and we can't hand out anything that's religious. Wrong. A case like this went up to the Supreme Court about 12 years ago, a good news club. It was an after-school Bible club. And the Supreme Court said, when you open the door to everyone else, you open the door to religion. Religion cannot be treated worse. In fact, just the opposite. Our founding fathers wrote the First Amendment to say the government cannot uh, restrict the free exercise of religion. And when you tell religious people and when you tell religious organizations they're not allowed, you're violating that. So again, find out what others are doing. Take advantage of that opportunity to get equal access. The other thing I was I mentioned earlier, we see a lot of school districts that, um, for financial reasons, maybe rent out to their school buses during the day. They've got these buses, they've got drivers on staff, uh, but they're only being used from you know, 7.30 to 9, and then from 3 to 5, or something like that. And so during the school day, some school districts will say, hey, if anybody wants to rent our school buses, you're free to rent them. Well, guess what? If other groups can rent them, so can you guys. And so a lot of times we see with transportation issues, your recent release time program is growing, the church 15 passenger van doesn't work, you need something bigger, contact the school. Say, hey, you guys have buses sitting empty, uh, you willing to rent them out? Absolutely, you've got a right to do it. Even if you're the only ones renting them, as long as the opportunity is open to anyone else, it doesn't matter if you're the only ones. Again, what the school does is we're neutral. We don't take a stance. Anybody can use our facilities, rent our buses, whatever. Uh, I also want to do one on uh, facilities. And this is, this is a very, very strange issue that I've only seen pop up once. Uh, the school in Ohio had an abandoned building. Uh, they weren't using it anymore for instruction. And so they said, hey, we'd like to uh, make some money off this. And so the school started renting it out. There was a daycare in there. There was some, you're not getting special treatment. You're just getting equal access. So again, be creative. Think outside the box on a lot of these things. And when you see another community group doing something to promote their program or to access a resource, take advantage of it. You guys have the right to do that as well. So again, just the things to look for. Uh, is the school giving community group access to a benefit, something like that? Uh, does the school have a written policy? Check what their policies say. A lot of times, Maybe they do rent buses, but nobody does it. So check into things like that. All right, a couple more last points real quick. Uh, next slide is on transportation. All right, uh, this is going to be a tricky one um, because I know several of you guys are experiencing this issue with, with Joy L and your use of buses and everything. Pennsylvania law is goofy. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. You guys have a law that I have not seen anywhere else in the country. And the law is this. It says... A school bus is anything that's designed to carry 11 people or more, and it's used to transport students to and from school. All right, in my mind, we all know what a school bus is. It's the big yellow thing that picks kids up at home and takes them. Apparently, Pennsylvania thinks, no, no, no. Anything that carries students anywhere, at any point, any time, and it touches school is a school bus. I think this is ridiculous for a lot of reasons. One, it, it, it seems to apply to you guys. If you guys have a 15-passenger church van, 
Under Pennsylvania law, you're a school bus, and that means there's these additional requirements in terms of getting a commercial license and inspections and some other stuff. Here's where I think it's, it's so goofy. So what if my family has several kids? Let's say we've got a family of six or seven kids, and we need a 15-passenger van. If I take my kids to school in that van, am I now a school bus? And do I now have to go as mom or dad and get a commercial driver's license? I think this is ridiculous, but I have to warn you guys, this is what the law says. Um, we are working with Joyelle. We actually produced a memo that we wrote specifically for you guys on how to address this issue. Uh, we're trying to work on some legislative approaches, and, and if you guys know state legislators, contact and point this out that this law is ridiculous. There needs to be an exception for you guys. But four quick things I want to hit that if this issue pops up with you guys, number one, contact Joy L. If it's a big legal issue, they can put you in touch with us. But we've given them some advice on how to respond to this. Number one is this really isn't transporting students to and from school. It's transporting them to and from release time. Number two, there's other sections of the law uh, that limit these things to vehicles that are owned or chartered by the school. Now to me that makes common sense. If the school owns a vehicle and it carries more than 11 kids, it's a school bus. If, you know, John Smith or, you know, such and such church owns it, it's not a school bus. So we're try what I'm trying to do is, if this comes up, if you guys get pulled over, it's kind of some arguments to say, hey, this is kind of ridiculous. This doesn't really apply against us. Number three is, years ago, there was a state attorney general opinion about this, but it was an older version of the law, and that's why it's important, but we can't say it's right on point. The law used to read something similar, that basically anything of a certain size was a school bus, and the attorney general wrote an opinion, I think this was back in 1940, and said, no, a bus neither owned nor used under contract for the school cannot be a school bus. So again, that kind of common sense approach that even the Attorney General years ago when this issue popped up said, that's ridiculous, it's not a school bus. And then finally, again, bring up that example. So if you're telling me if I'm a mom and I'm a 15 passenger van, I have to be commercially licensed. So be aware of these issues. Again, we want to try and comply with the law, but at the same time, sometimes laws are ridiculous. And this may be one that if we can't get it changed, we may need to challenge it and say it's a burden on you guys' religion to have this happen to you. All right, one final point I want to hit real quick, um, and then I want to open it up to questions. And so, again, if you guys have questions, I hope you've written them down, uh, and we'll discuss them. So let's go to the next slide. This is a, a little outside of release time, but it's connected. I want to talk about students' rights. See, you guys are pouring the gospel into students. And one of the things I think you want is for those students to take what they're learning in your class, take it back into the school building with them, and start sharing their faith. That when they see a friend going through a difficult circumstance, they say, hey, can I pray for you? Hey, I just read this great Bible verse that we were memorizing that talks about what you're going through. Can I read that to you? But we're seeing a lot of times students being under, being told that their religion is not welcome at school. They'll, they'll say, no, the moment you step inside these doors, it's a religion-free zone. This is false. But let me give you guys a story, and, and this, this happened yesterday, okay? Uh, back in February, there was a school, a uh, Nazareth area school district, um, just outside of Allentown. Uh, and the school there was having a Valentine's Day party. Um, and, uh, well, they called it a Friendship Day party, because it's got to be politically correct. Someone may be offended by Valentine. So this first grader uh, came in and wanted to share his faith. So a lot of kids were bringing in a variety of cards. Um, it was crazy, some of the stuff on cards. One of them was a laughing skull. Uh, another one was cartoon characters, little Star Wars stormtroopers pointing a gun. Um, and I'm like, this has to do with Valentine's how? Um, so this one student, his name's J.A., it's not his name, but we have to protect his confidentiality right now, um, brought in a Valentine card that he and his family had made. When they knew they were doing this, uh, they started researching what Valentine is. And they found out, oh, it's named after St. Valentine, that he was a preacher of the gospel, that he was persecuted and martyred for performing Christian marriages. Uh, and so that's who we're celebrating today. And so he, he has this little card printed up and says, hey, in honor of St. Valentine's, I want, you to, I want to let you know God loves you. And then proceeded to quote John 3.16. 
He brings it to school with him, brings it into the classroom. Uh, they have little boxes. He puts them in the box, hands one to his teacher. His teacher opens it up, sees the religious stuff, takes them out and says, you can't do that. They proceed to, proceed to confiscate his cards, tear out the religious part, and so he's left having to distribute a blank Valentine card at his school. A first grader being told his face not welcome. The sad part is this left a, a, a really bad impression on this student. He had been praying before his meals, and he stopped doing that because he was afraid he was going to get in trouble to do it. And he went today to school every day under the fear of what would happen if he expressed his faith. We have to do more than just pour the gospel into these kids. We have to embolden them, just like we're doing today with you guys, to let you guys know the law is on your side, the law is on the student's side. Three things I want you guys to know, three words. Speak, meet, and equal treatment. Students have the right to share their faith at school. They have the right to talk about their faith. They have the right to hand out religious materials. They have the right to hand out invitations to release time. You want to grow your program? Give the kids a bunch of invitations. Send them into the school with their friends. Hey, you got to come check out release time. This thing is awesome. We did these activities and learn all this great stuff. Because the word of mouth from a student is going to be way more effective than anything any adult could ever say. So release your kids to go in there with invitations to invite other kids to release time. They have the right to share their faith. Even in classroom activities and assignments, they have the right to incorporate their faith into it. Number two, they have the right to meet. They have the right to get together, whether it's around the flagpole before the start of school to pray. They can do that. They can form their own in-school in Bible clubs, which again usually happens more in high school. Um, they have the right to form these types of clubs, to meet together, to share their faith with one another. Sports teams have the right to get together and pray in the locker room before a game. So many rights that students have to express and share their faith at school. And the last one is equal treatment. Students have the right to get the same access that every other student does. If students are allowed to make a morning announcement about their club, then the Bible club is allowed to have that same access to do it. So I encourage you guys, as you're pouring the gospel into these kids, empower them to take that gospel into the school and tell them the law protects your right. So I want to tell you how the J.A. story wrapped up. Uh, yesterday we had a court hearing uh, about all of this, and the court hearing ended with the school having to change their policy and to recognize the right of every student in the district to share the faith of school. And so, J.A.'s parents sent me an email, uh, a text message this morning, and J.A. had a little assignment he was supposed to fill out. Um, I wish I would gotten a picture of it, um, but it was like, what's your name, what are your favorite, you know, your favorite thing, favorite food, pineapple, and all this stuff. And um, the last question on there, let me pull this up. It said, I am special because blank. And here's how Justice filled it out. God made me that way. And his dad wrote me and said, he's emboldened to share his faith again at school. And all because this little first grader and his family had the courage to stand up for their rights and to say, this is wrong. I've got the right to share my faith at school. And I want you guys to have that same courage. You have the right and the privilege to do release time. And these students have the right to then take what they give, you give them into school with them and impact the school. So I encourage you guys, be bold in all of this. Be smart, be Teflon coated, follow the law. But then once you do so, go forth in confidence that the law is on your side. Joy All Ministries has your back and Alliance Defending Freedom. If legal issues arise, we've got your back. So I want to open up, we've got about, uh, think about five minutes. If anybody has any questions or anything real quick. Yes, sir. I was just wondering.